So we are going to discuss about age hardening systems today and uh, trying to explain you how in aluminum copper alloys the fast phase transformations of precipitation formation and its growth can control its mechanical and physical properties. Basically we have discussed so far that aluminum copper especially the aluminum rich copper alloys undergo precipitation hardenable phase transformation and uh, here in this slide I am showing you a part of the phase diagram of aluminum copper as you see the phase diagram which involves alpha phase and the liquid plus alpha phase is shown and on the top of which there are few dotted lines and these dotted lines indicate the formation of the transient phases during aging treatment of aluminum copper alloys. The most important alloy is aluminum 4 weight percent copper which is known as duralumin and as you see here the typical phase transformation, typical heat treatment cycle which leads to precipitation hardening is kind of like this. If I take a aluminum 4 weight percent copper alloy, first thing we do is we heat this alloy to the single phase region single phase region and because of this treatment which is known as annealing treatment all the precipitates which are present in the alloy dissolves dissolve in the alpha phase and then we form a single phase homogeneous alpha and th this is followed by quenching to room temperature okay just quenching means just take the alloy at a high temperature and put it into water directly. So therefore there will be a change in the, there will, be, there will be a change of rapid change of temperatures because of this treatment and it will allow the all the copper atoms present in the aluminum retained in the microstructure. And the next one which involves aging is basically nothing but heating this alloy to a temperature between 150 to 200 degrees Celsius temperature, so 150 to 200 it tells us temperature okay this is 100 to 200 so something around 130 to 190 degrees celsius in the temperature range these alloys which are quenched are given treatment for different time duration and because of that precipitates form and we have seen that precipitation formation is basically happens in a stage in a manner which is some sort given by these first the gp jones forms is followed by theta double prime and theta prime and then finally the equivalent precipitate theta which has a composition of Cu2 Al forms that we have seen and uh, I have told you that this can be explained using free energy composition diagram uh, such like this let us not go back into that it helps you to explain different you know equilibrium comp compositions between these transient phases GP Jones to theta double prime and theta prime with the alpha and this can be easily then described. To give you an perspective that you know this uh, all you know that GP zone is nothing but a few layers of copper atoms sitting on this 1O planes of aluminum alpha aluminum lattice and then theta double prime and theta prime is basically some sort of coherent structure along the different interfaces as described here theta double prime has a coherency along all interfaces therefore it retains low energy interfaces with the matrix theta double prime theta prime actually has coherent or semi coherent along one zero zero one planes but non coherent on one o or zero zero one zero planes and on the other hand theta which is equivalent precipitate is completely in coherent structure so therefore the tangent phases actually help us produce different kinds of interfaces between these phases and the matrix this is what I told you also and some of the microstructures which is shown you again show me because it helps you to understand you know GP Jones as basically is nothing but extra one or two layers of copper atoms on the aluminum one or planes so therefore they lead to a strain matrix which is shown here 
Similarly, theta double prime is also coherent along all interfaces. Only thing it can lead to in the microstructure is such a kind of a coherency strain, which we have discussed in our previous lectures. So, this will lead to a certain kind of a strain matrix, and this is what is seen here. These are the theta double prime precipitates. Theta prime precipitate, which looks like a much bigger, they are again elongated, long. And theta is basically a very well defined precipitates with no coherency along any of these interfaces. So, that is what is what is the truth. And in obviously, nucleation of this phase happens along the gain boundaries or the dislocations, and this can be used to alter the microstructures. As you see here, the gain boundary is present in which theta has precipitated, similarly, theta prime has precipitated along a certain. <coughs> Gain boundaries. So, it is possible to precipitate uh, these, uh, nucleate these precipitates along the defects in the matrix. Now, let us first discuss actually what happens that was recapitulation, what actually have, what happens when you heat treat these alloys during aging treatments. I am showing you the plots which are taken from uh, this uh, paper by Silcock long back, it is in 1954. And this actually is very, very, uh, this tells you actually what actually happens in during aging treatments. Let us look at the top part of that. What is plotted here is the Vickers hardness versus aging time in terms of days for different concentrations of these alloys. Okay. And the aging treatment, similarly the bottom picture is same thing, only difference is that the aging has been done at a higher temperatures at about 900 degrees, 190 degrees Celsius temperature, sorry. And uh, so, let us first look at the top curve. As you see here, if you look at 2 8 percent copper alloy, which is a very lean copper aluminum copper alloy, the uh, aging treatment at, at a lower temperature 130 degrees Celsius temperatures gives you a, you know, takes a lot of time to start the precipitation basically. It takes about 10 days to start the precipitation. Uh, basically, that is the time in which G P Jones forms. Then slowly hardness increases and it takes about couple of it takes about 200 days to get a optimum hardness. So, that is the problem using a low aging temperatures. If you say low aging temperatures, kinetics of formation of these precipitates is very low. It is little bit improves if you increase the concentration of copper, because copper is what is leading to the formation of the precipitates starting from G P Jones to theta double prime and theta prime. If, but you see it takes quite a lot of time about you know 50 days to reach a peak hardness. The peak hardness means the hardness actually, hardness actually starts with a very low value initially then increases and reaches a maximum then again decreases. This is a typical hardness curve or aging curves which I have already discussed in the last lecture. So, the peak hardness means the temperature or time at which the hardness is achieving the maximum value. So, as you see here if this aging is done at about 130 degrees Celsius temperature, the time required to achieve peak hardness for alloys with 3 to 4.5 percent copper alloy does not change, it remains same. On the other hand, if we age at 990 degrees Celsius temperatures, which is about 60 degrees higher than this, the peak hardness temp time required to achieve the peak hardness is of very low. It can be obtained even less than one day of heat treatment, it is about something like 6 to 7 hours is enough. Not only that, even for the very lean copper alloys like 2 atom percent cop, 2 8 percent copper alloys, it requires about 7 to 8 days to achieve the peak hardness level. So, that means what? The aging temperature has a profound role in defining or in leading to the formation of these precipitates and which can actually lead to a very uh, you know interesting aspects in the actual production. Because when you are preparing these alloys for these actually when you are doing the heat treatment of these alloys for different components, important aspect is to reduce the time. But you know if you uh, want to reduce the time quite a bit by increasing temperature very high, it leads to coarsening of the precipitates very rapidly. That is also a problem. So, therefore, the optimum temperatures of heat treatment for the most of these alloys during aging is something around 150 to 170 degrees Celsius temperatures. So, 190 is actually a little on the higher side, 130 is on the lower side. So, these particular view graphs tells you that these heat treatment or aging treatment must be done with the optimum selection of temperature. And remember these uh, points which are shown here, the points are basically for theta prime uh, because this tells you the what kind of precipitates to form. Surprisingly, if you look at the lean alloys, okay, just after you know G P zone, it directly goes into theta prime as you see here. 
But on the other hand, for the little richer alloys with four and more than four percent copper alloys, and three actually three and more than three alloys, three per weight percent copper alloys, uh, the sequence is all just like what we see in the real microstructural length scale. That is GP zone followed by theta double prime and theta, and obviously at a very high temperature, a very high time, theta will precipitate. That's what is not shown here. But that is not actually desirable because theta has incoherent microstructure interfaces with the alpha. So, therefore, the hardness decreases further. So, uh, why such a curve? Why is uh, this such a kind of behavior you observe? First of all, you know, GP zones are basically what? They are actually copper layers sitting on the aluminum planes. I have been telling you again and again. So, these copper layers actually start blocking the dislocation motion. But because there are only few layers of copper atoms, the hardening is not very high. Hardening is basically coming from the coherence strain which is generated in the matrix. So, therefore, the hardness increase because of the GP zone formation is not very high. But the moment the theta prime or theta double prime actually starts forming, the hardness increases very rapidly. Reason is very simple theta double prime, as you see here in the previous plots theta double prime is this structure. It has a tetragonal structure built in automatically with a, a and b is same 4.04 Armstrong, but c is about 6.7.68 Armstrong. Okay. And it consists of alternate two layers of copper on the both sides of the 001 planes of aluminum. Inside you have aluminum layers. You see here that this round, the, this open circles are basically aluminum and the closed one is copper. So, basically it develops two layers of copper on the both sides of the aluminum and these layers of copper actually leads to distortion of this lat lattice or rather increase of the C axis of the lattice and gives you a theta double prime tetragonal lattice. So, but very interestingly although this forms the kind of structure all the interfaces whether this is 001 one zero zero or zero one zero. That means all the all the uh, you know faces of this tetragonal unit cell remains coherent with the aluminum lattice. Aluminum is shown here, and this coherency is basically gives the increase of hardness more because as the dislocation moves from the alpha to the precipitate theta double prime, there is the strain or this basically the between the precipitate and the matrix. There is a there is a stress develop because of this coherence strain and this stress actually block the dislocations to move inside these precipitates. Because as you know if the precipitate is present in the matrix like this and a dislocation needs to be uh, needs to move uh, you know like that a dislocation is present somewhere there and it has to pass through it and if the matrix and the precipitate has a coherence microstructure only way dislocation can pass through is by cutting it through. That means, it can it has to create two new interfaces. If it has to move here, this precipitate which is shown here will be cut into two pieces okay. and that is what happens. Okay. And because of these uh, you know uh, cutting methods, precipitate size is very small obviously for the theta double prime and so uh, because of these two in new interfaces generated, so work done is pretty high and that is why the dislocation motion is hindered. But on the other hand as the theta prime forms or space transformation at the higher time or maybe at higher temperatures whichever is true, theta prime is going to be forming and theta prime has also tetragonal lattice structure. But difference is that theta prime atomic elements is different. As you see here the two layers 001 okay, on the top and the bottom actually they consist of aluminum atoms. On the other hand the central layer is also aluminum atoms and from the from these copper atoms present at the different corners of the faces of these tetragonal lattice. So, because of that the this phase loses its coherency along you know 100 or 001 planes. That means, coherency along these 100 planes are these ones, these facets, these are the 100 and 001 planes are these ones. So, they lose the coherency. Only coherency maintained is on the aluminum positions, aluminum uh, sorry on the top and bottom planes. So, because of that now dislocation has two choices either it can cut through this precipitate or it can form a loop around it when the dislocation move. It can form a loop around it when it passes through. Obviously, dislocation will come like this and then slowly bend it and then once it bends it can basically form a loop like this. Okay. So, finally, 
it will leave behind this is the precipitates ok let me tell you. So, this is uh, let, let us first remove this part ok. So, this is the precipitate and it comes close to the precipitate then it bends and then finally, it loops behind a loop and then it moves ahead. So, because of that because it creates a loop around the dislocation this is known as R 1's mechanism because of that the new dislocation which is coming again will be subjected to a stress field generated by the loop. So, more number of dislocation passes to more loops will be forming at, uh, around this precipitates and the stress field generated will be higher and that gives this strength. But remember this depends on the distance between these precipitates present. If the precipitates has to be you know in a particular separation otherwise this kind of uh, bowing of dislocation leading to formation of a loop will not happen. So, that is why the precipitate size must be little bigger as compared to theta double prime. Theta on the other hand is basically a completely incoherent structure. So, only way dislocation can pass through is making the loops around it and they will be obviously bigger in size because the growth will happen at a higher temperature time. So, because of that the material st loses strength slowly and that is why the, the hardness slowly drops off. So, that is the main reason why you see such a kind of such a kind of aging curves in the microstructure or in the real heat treatment. So, uh, uh, therefore, if I want to create a good material which is be applicable for the various uh, potential applications. So, we need to have combinations of good hardness and the ductility and that is only possible when you have on this side of the curve ok on the rising side of the curve ok that is what I am showing you here in all the cases. So, if, if, if the heat treatment is done in such way that the temperature and time is selected properly then we can be uh, you know hardness can be made, you know on the increasing side of these hardness plots. And then uh, we can achieve a good combination of the strength and ductility that is what is actually done. So, the selection of these heat treatment temperature and time has to be judiciously done otherwise alloys will not be applicable in real applications. That is very important aspect which you must remember you know there are other things which should also remember. You have to understand that these precipitates which are forming they are forming basically or nucleating on the gain boundaries or on the internal dislocations presence near the gain boundary as well as within the grains. So, we can actually improve the aging efficiency or the ability of the alloy to age with nicely by doing adopting two di different approaches. One which is very routinely done is that after solution aging treatment and followed by quenching the alloy can be given a deformation plastic deformation which is simply rolling it or giving a forging treatment. But doing that we create large number of dislocations or defect structure in the alloy in the in the sample. And then if we this was this is followed by aging treatment that means this uh, you know deformation is given prior to the aging treatment deformation will lead to dislocation and defect structure and then the aging defects will allow the nucleation of these precipitates very easily. So, therefore, one of the ways to achieve faster aging and better distribution of the precipitates in the microstructure is to give a prior plastic deformation to the prior to the aging treatment. Other way is to use what is known as double aging treatment. Double aging treatment means we can actually have aging treatment done at a lower temperature something like 120 degree Celsius here and this will only lead to formation of GP zones large number of DP zones will form because other precipitates will not form at the temperature. GP zones will be preferentially forming across the whole microstructure or across the whole sample. Then this sample can be again taken to higher temperature like something 170 to 175 degrees Celsius temperature and kept there for some time. As the GP zones has homogeneously formed in the microstructure because with lower aging temperatures in the first stage this will allow the formation of the precipitation of the precipitates like theta double prime and theta easily on the GP zones. So, by using either a plastic deformation prior to the aging treatment or by using a double so double stage aging treatment we can actually improve the mechanical properties of these alloys extensively and these are routinely done in the actual practices. Actually all the alloys which are used for the aeroplane body is normally heat treated or aging treatment is done after the plastic deformation. 
just to increase the nucleation density of these precipitates in the microstructure. Okay, uh, another important aspect which I already discussed, let me tell you again, using this kinetics of the heat treatment or aging treatment, one can actually generate something like a time temperature transformation curves. Although it is not truly TTT curve, but it can be. So, here as you see here, this is the phase diagram which is shown alpha and theta and these are these dotted lines which are corresponding to the different transient precipitates, GP zone, theta double prime and theta prime. Now, we can, we can have something like a nucleation and growth kinetics built in into that and these curves are obtained like that. Obviously, this looks like a John Solomon equation which is available for the steels. Why? Because any, if you look at any transformations, the transformation rate depends on if I plot time versus temperature versus time, transformation will be maximum at some intermediate temperatures, at higher temperature it will be lower and lower temperature it will be lower. Lower. This is mainly because at high temperatures the diving force available is low. So, therefore, nucleation and growth rates are low. But lower temperatures, nucleation diving force will be higher, but because diffusion is slow, so therefore growth will be slow in a precipitation hardenable or diffusion and transformation by the way. So, that is why you always see a C separate cut. So, at the intermediate temperature, somewhere between that, both the optimum value of nucleation rate and growth rate can be achieved because diffusion as well as the driving force both has to be optimally chosen. And that is why all these curves such a C shaped uh, nature and GP zones because it forms at a lower temperature. So, therefore, they will reach they will be starting at a lower time scale a lower temperature both followed by theta double prime theta and th prime and theta. So, uh, this curves allows you to select the heat treatment cycles right. You can clearly see this is the time log this is the temperature. So, if I simply do a double heat treatment first, I can simply allow these things to happen like that. So, therefore, a lot of large number of GP zones will form in the microstructure, then I can heat it up little higher temperature and keep it there long time. So, it will allow me to form large number of theta double prime on the existing GP zones and that is why it can be done. In fact, in many of these uh, actual practices, sometime people give an even three stage heat treatment, heat it up and keep it there also. So, you can actually have combinations of GP zone, zero double prime and theta prime forming in the microstructure and give you the optimum value of the hardness. So, such a kind of uh, general, you know TTT curves or transformation temperature curves can allow you to basically select your heat treatment cycles very nicely. Okay, so, that is the uh, important part and uh, another important thing which I should discuss is that as you know uh, this is this is important because of the heat treatment cycle which you do. Remember that the first thing we do in the heat treatment cycle is solutionizing at a high temperature, something like about 500 to 550 degrees Celsius temperature for the aluminum copper alloys. Because of the solutionizing temp, uh, temperature, all these precipitates theta prime gets dissolved into the alpha matrix. And at a high temperature, obviously, this is done. So, therefore, there will be large number of vacancies created at high temperature. As you know, the equilibrium number of vacancy depends on the temperature in a particular material. So, high temperature there will be large number of vacancies created and they will be remain as a equilibrium defects. Now, as a part of the heat treatment, this high temperature solutionized treatment is always followed by quenching at room temperature. So, as you quench at room temperature, all the precipitate, all these sorry, all these uh, vacancies which are formed will be quenched in, in the microstructures. Now, these vacancies which are quenched in from the high temperature, low temperature has a preferential role or very important role to play because these vacancies can then coalesce and form vacancy loop and they can also form dislocations. They can lead to cross slip also of dislocations because of the availability of these things. But most important thing they can allow it to happen is, is the diffusion of the copper atoms because diffusion normally happens in the substitution of solid solutions by vacancy movement. So, the vacancies are actually present in large number during aging treatments th this allows us to you know diffusion to have faster. That is one important aspect. As I told you diffusion has a sink, dislocation will act as a sink for the diffusions because diff sorry uh, for the for these vacancies. Vacancies will form a loop and this can be again lead to formation of dislocations. There is another very important sink in the microstructure for the dis for these the vacancies that is the gain boundaries. Gain boundaries are basically haphazard structures if you look at it 
and because of that these deficiencies can slowly move into the gain boundaries and get you know sunk by the gain boundaries. So, therefore, if I plot the distribution of the fraction of the vacancies as a function of distance between the two grains, as you see here that the gain boundaries the vacancy concentration equilibrium vacancy concentration is very basically very low. So, therefore, these vacancies which will be you know uh, present at the gain boundaries will not allow the precipitates to form because the for the precipitates to form you need certain minimum amount of copper atoms because GP zones actually is nothing but the copper layers present on the aluminum alpha aluminum FCC lattice. So, uh, because of that the, 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 the G zones in the gain boundaries will be precipitation free and these zones are called precipitation free zones or PFZ in the literature. This is widely seen. Obviously, quenching rate also has a role. If you quench very fast, as you see here, if you quench very fast, you create, you retain certain amount of vacancies inside the grain, but at the bend boundaries, there is a rapid drop of the vacancy concentration. That is because gain boundary acts as a sink for the vacancies. Vacancies will go and you know get lost in the in the gain boundaries. So, there will be reduction of the vacancies concentration in the gain boundaries. And because of that, obviously, the copper atoms cannot uh, form these GP zones and precipitation is not possible. This is widely observed in the uh, microstructure, like this one you see here. This is the these are the three you know, gain boundaries or three gains meeting at a point. So, near the gain boundary, there is a precipitation free zone present, which is widely observed in the aluminum copper, aluminum zinc, magnesium, copper alloy. And these precipitates here actually also theta. A GP zone and theta double prime. Okay, so, in the last uh, at the end of this last portion of the uh, this uh, part of precipitation hardening, let me just tell you aluminum copper is not only the one alloy which undergoes precipitation hardening available uh, precipitation hardening, but there are many others. One of the important one is al silver aluminum, which I mentioned in the last class. Silver aluminum also forms two phases as you see here. What are the phases it forms? This is alpha uh, phase, this is aluminum bridge, silver concentration is something like about maximum is about 80 percent at the eutectic temperatures and then you have a uh, you know, equilibrium between gamma and the alpha. Gamma is actually hexagonal structure here and because of that gamma is hexagonal structure and because of that that is uh, these alloys also undergo specific hardening. hardening. And the, th the way things happen is this again I let me not discuss the whole thing alpha 0 which is super saturated solutions it first forms alpha 1 plus G p zone then it becomes alpha 2 plus theta a uh, gamma prime and then alpha 3 plus gamma. Remember gamma prime and gamma both as hexagonal structure. On the other hand alpha has a FCC structure. So, therefore, the only orientation relationship which is possible which can lead to coherency between these precipitates okay, uh, gamma prime or gamma basically gamma prime is such a kind of things that 0 0 1 or plane of gamma prime must be parallel with 1 1 1 plane of alpha similarly 1 1 1 2 word 0 direction of gamma prime must be parallel with 1 1 0 direction of alpha. So, that is the that is the uh, coherent uh, that allows to have the coherency between the precipitates and the matrix phase and it is seen to be uh, specifically observed. Only problem is that because of the silver which is expensive material this alloys are not used so much, but as you see here these alloys can be used actually little higher temperature than, than the aluminum copper alloys because the uh, uh, the solvers which is shown here can actually go up to 550 degrees Celsius temperature. So, uh, the treatments will remain same again you take any alloy heat it up to the solvers temperature above the solvers temperature then followed by quenching and then one can do heat treatment at different temperature either here or little higher or little higher depends on wherever. So, that is this uh, routine way of doing the things. Here again uh, the basically uh, the precipitates the final gamma uh, precipitates is Ag2 Al and uh, they are actually plate separate they looks like a plate like aluminum Al2 Cu and uh, the behavior is almost similar. Okay, so, let me uh, stop here for the uh, this part of this portion of this lecture in that. Uh, so, therefore, precipitation hardening is basically an important class of alloys and these phase transformations are to be nicely 
known to all of us because they becomes a very important class of alloys. And there are many such, I have only taken the example of aluminum copper to explain you the different aspects of the precipitation hardening and I have given you at the end some example from aluminum silver alloys. So, in the next lecture we are going to start with another diffusional transformation that is known as eutectoid transformation.